question, Eros answered that it was love, her husband. The perplexed psyche could not be satisfied with mere assurances of love. The insistent call of the imprisoned soul for knowledge through all the senses demanded recognition. She must see love. Love without passion does not satisfy mankind. It is a state of feeling undemonstrated. The urge in man must know, see, feel, and possess. Eros informs Psyche that because of an unalterable decree, she would never behold his face. Only in darkness could he come to her. Only in secrecy could she know his embrace. To accept love as it is offered, to live surrounded by love, with thoughts unmixed with doubt or suspicion, would lift the soul to the heaven of happiness and immortality. Man, in his attempt to sect and analyze, opens the way to grief and pain, worry and fear, doubt and misfortune. As darkness falls, or as the soul sinks deeper into the realm of matter, it feels the presence of unseen shapes about it. Fear contends with love, while passion awaits nearby. But Eros, love, makes himself heard through the veil of flesh, and whispers, Fear not, though the darkness of night surround thee, flesh covering the soul, I am with thee. My love shall sustain and protect thee. No matter where thou goest, to heaven or hell, thou art mine, my beloved, as I am thine, for I am love, the delight of the world, the giver of life. With love in the soul, there is nothing to fear. When the soul is supported by love, evil is powerless. Love not only gives life, not only bequeaths youth, health, and strength, but molds and perfects mankind. As Psyche received Eros, love, a thrill of joy, passed through her. She opened her arms to the tender form of the lovely youth and cried, who art thou that takest pity on one doomed to be a sacrifice to the most terrible monster of the demons of hell? Eros answered, Fear not the monster of whom the oracle spoke. I am thy husband. I am he before whom both gods and fiends have reason to tremble. Love, supreme, is the husband of the soul. It may lead its spouse to the innermost shrine of heaven, its shadow, lust, may lead to the lowest round of hell. Though often mistaken for love, lust roams the earth, seducing, betraying, destroying womanhood. This unspeakable evil was the demon, the dragon, the monster, for which the knight's grail banded together to slay. All illnesses of women stem from the lust of men. Love supreme is the husband of the soul. Psyche, still fearful, replies, Why, if thou art death, that fearful ruler of the land of shades, whom even the mighty Zeus dreads, why comest thou in so pleasing a disguise? Thy voice is music, thy breath the perfume of roses, and the touch of thy lips enraptures me. What shall I call thee? The answer of Eros, Call me love, is a light set in the midst of darkness. Love dissipates the blackness and unreality of death, disintegrates carnal, sensual desires. The love-encircled soul is able to resist destroying passions. It slays the dragon in its sacrifice to gain that which is real. Interpret it in another way, death, in the pleasing disguise of reward and release, kisses the lips of the weary, bids the soul fear not, and liberates it from the thraldom of earth. Love presides at birth, for through it the soul descends to earth, and its consequent experiences and lessons. Love presides at death, for through it the soul ascends to freedom, peace, and joy. O love and death, O death and love, how wondrous can ye are, the planet Venus thus at once is evening and the morning star. O love and death, O death and love, life ended, life begun. The sun may rise, the sun may set, tis still the self-same sun. Life's problem here at last is solved. Step in, the door is ajar. O love and death, death 
and love, how wondrous kin ye are. Psyche and Eros lived happily together, even though the strangeness of life caused her momentary fear. The soul, surrounded by the darkness, the unreality of earth, seems bound to question the promises of love. Still, unless haunted by the phantoms of doubt and suspicion, the soul retains a general state of peace and happiness. But as time passed, the variety and newness of love waned, and doubt and suspicion became easy to entertain. Eros granted Psyche entire freedom in the selection of her guests, stipulating only that he be not questioned. The generosity and goodness of Eros roused the phantoms to a more spirited action. They urged her to insist upon knowing whom her husband really was. Surrounded by secrecy, how did she know that he was wholly hers? Could she depend upon him to supply her every need? With these questions and inferences, they opened the door to the most deadly of the phantom sisterhood, jealousy. The carnal mind, insisting upon proofs that can be seen and felt, refuses unseen verities. Mind immersed in materiality prefers a chaos of fact and objectivity to a cosmos of harmony and beauty. Eros, noting the perplexity, uncertainty, and unrest of Psyche, following the visits of the fiends disguised as friends, warned her, I beseech thee to be on thy guard, not only for the sake of our happiness, but because of the child, immorality, thou shalt bear me. If thy guests importune, torment, and worry thee to discover my identity, and thou succumb, I shall leave thee. It is beyond my power to oppose the will of God. I mispronounce the name of the child. It's immortality, not immorality. Immortality. Psyche replied that with him near, happiness enveloped her. His touch filled her with aspiration and trust. His voice, as the wings of faith, lifted her to the realms of peace and security, but often she felt alone, and the group of sisters, though ugly, entertained her. It came about that inquisitiveness and fear were added to the brood that daily haunted the heart psyche. Surrounded by their influence, Eros was helpless. Though possessed of the power of the gods, love cannot dwell in the heart of suspicion. At last, unable to resist the combined influence of the demons, Psyche was persuaded to take her lamp, steal quietly into the chamber of Eros, and gaze upon the face of her beloved. As it lay revealed, a drop of oil caused him to awaken. At the instant of revelation, beholding a being of wondrous youth and beauty, she knew her fears, doubts, and suspicions to be groundless. At the moment of realization that she had possessed all that heart and life could desire because of a broken law, it was taken from her. The fiend of disobedience had completed her undoing. Psyche, Psyche, thou hast betrayed me. Now must I leave thee. Alone shalt thou suffer from the intrigues of thine enemies. Eros and Psyche parted. Love and soul were divided. In other words, soul, because of questionings, unbeliefs, doubts, unrest, severed itself from the heaven of faith, peace, and happiness. This is the story and the reason of the pilgrimage of the soul on the earth plain. How often is this story repeated in the homes of thousands today? Faith, security, happiness, bartered for doubts, suspicions, and jealousies. Psyche, adrift, despairing, was bereft of all things but hope. Having discovered the destructive power of evil thought, she turned about to win back the love, the heaven she had forfeited. To human justice, it would seem that now Aphrodite, divine law, would relent, having witnessed the undoing of Psyche, but not so. The pain and suffering and longing of Psyche could in no wise mitigate her punishment. Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. To have reinstated Psyche among the gods would presuppose a power greater than law which could nullify or soften its own edicts. Law is 